Thanks to his death for us on the cross, Jesus can bring us from no relationship at all with God, not even convinced he exists, to calling him Father. Do please have a seat. I want to uh, apologise to our magnificent choir that I will spend most of my time with, their back, with my back to them. I will try and turn round. It's a bit like being an umpire at Wimbledon. Um, and now we're seated. Can I lead us in a prayer? Father, help us to understand what you were doing that first Easter and what it has to do with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder how you would describe your relationship with God today. I guess for some of us, it will be like our relationship with the Queen. I mean, I've sung the school song to the Queen. She came to visit. Uh, she sent my granny a 100th birthday telegram, but I wouldn't call it friendship. She's uh, a distant figure with whom I have no personal relationship. And at one time, I would have said the same about God. Um, I don't know about you, I come from a non-Christian home. Dad was an atheist, mum is agnostic. They only ever took me to church twice, once for a funeral and once for a wedding, at which, embarrassingly, I was a page boy and I would love to destroy all photographic evidence. <laughs> and yet, without any encouragement to believe in him, I knew deep down that God was there, as we all do. I just didn't have a clue of how I could relate to him until I was invited to something like this, which explained what God did that first Easter to make that possible. So that's what I want to talk about from those readings we had earlier. So I wonder if you would find page four in your service sheet and that first Bible reading. This is not fiction. Um, this is from one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And let me read from the start again of that reading on page four. It says, so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha, and there they crucified him. Which was the Roman Empire's death penalty. They nailed offenders to a cross and left them to die. So that is what happened to Jesus, that first Good Friday, and if you understand why, you have the answer to three of life's most important questions. The first is this. What has gone wrong between us and God? My brother Neil is pretty senior in Vodafone, so if you're with them, can I say thanks for subsidizing my birthday and Christmas presents. Um, he's overpaid, he's generous. Uh, he doesn't share my faith, but on one occasion I said to him, Neil, do you believe that God is there? And he said, yes, definitely. And so I said to him, well, if it even might be true that God has made himself knowable through Jesus, wouldn't that be worth looking into? And he said, I don't really want to. And I said, why? And he said, I feel a deep antipathy towards him. And I said, why? And he said, I guess I just don't want him interfering in my life. And uh, Neil doesn't use big words normally, like antipathy, unless he's playing Scrabble and, and he sees a P on a triple letter score. But it was a really well-chosen word. Because deep down, that is the attitude that we all have towards God, isn't it? That, that actually, we don't want him interfering in our life. We, we just want to keep him at arm's length. We don't want him telling us what is right and what is wrong and what has to change. And at one level, that is why Jesus died on the cross, because he came into the world saying and showing clearly that he was God's son, the rightful ruler of our lives, and the leadership of the day rejected that claim because they didn't want it to be true for them. And by political manoeuvring, they got the Roman governor, Pilate, to have him crucified, to get rid of him, so they thought. So look on to verse 19, little number 19, in that reading on page 4. Pilate also wrote an, ins an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said I'm the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So when they crucified someone, they, they wrote a sign to say why they had been crucified. And to spite the people who got Jesus crucified, Pilate wrote exactly what Jesus had claimed, which was that he is the divine ruler of every one of us. And so the irony is that sign said exactly why Jesus was crucified. He came into the world saying, I am your rightful king, and people did not want that claim to be true. So when we look at the cross of Jesus, the first thing we actually see is our own natural attitude to God mirrored there. I do not want you to be my king. And I wonder if that's where you are right now in your relationship with God. I never realized that that's where you begin, that's where I was, until friends started trying to invite me to something like this. Um, I'd been packed off to a boarding school and on Sunday morning there was compulsory chapel followed by voluntary Christian union. And Thursday or Friday, most weeks, this one faithful friend of mine invited me to the Christian Union, which gave me time to go away and organize something like a game of squash and come back to him and say, I'm really sorry, I'm busy. One week he played the dirty on me and he invited me just as we were walking out of chapel. And I had nowhere to run. The only reason I said yes was that I couldn't think quickly enough of a credible reason to say no. I actually came to faith through that very first talk I heard, which was about the cross. But looking back, I can see very clearly all my saying no to that friend was actually the horizontal symptom of saying no to God. I don't want you as my king. And on the one hand, you may be willing to admit that that is you right now, that you're with my brother, that uh, you're living by your own definition of right and wrong, and you don't want God interfering with that. On the other hand, you may be saying, I don't see myself like this at all. I, I'm, I'm not anti-God. I've, I've tried to live a good life. But the Bible's question is, have you been trying to live for Jesus, his son, by his definition of good? Because if the answer to that is no, then however good we have been relative to others, relative to God, we have still committed the ultimate offense of living in his world as if he was not there. And the Bible calls us to admit that consciously or subconsciously, we have all done that to him, said no to God. And it warns us that if we keep saying no all the way to the end of our lives, then with no pleasure, at the end of them, he will have to say no to us. You can't be part of my kingdom. You've got to stay outside because you cannot be in a kingdom where you won't recognize the king. So that's what's gone wrong between us and God. The second question is, what has God done to put it right? And this is where Christianity is totally unique. Um, you hear people all the time saying all religions are basically the same. And people saying like that, it's a bit like saying instant coffee and real coffee are basically the same. It just shows you don't know the first thing about coffee. You've got no taste at all. And um, when it comes to the other religions, none of them even asks the question, what has God done to put us right with him? They're all asking the question, what must we do? They're, they're DIY, they're do-it-yourself religions. So, for example, I was doing a dinner event uh, with a talk like this in the middle, and after I'd finished speaking, um, I sat down next to the nice Muslim woman, woman next to me, and um, I decided just to jump in. I said, so if you were run over by a bus on the way home tonight and you had to face Allah, how do you think it would go? It was my usual light after dinner banter, you know, and <laughs> have another after eight. Um, and she said, well, we believe that he will judge us on whether or not our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds. And so I said to her, well, how do you think that stands right now? And she very honestly said, not good. So I pushed my luck and I said, and do you think that's going to change this side of when you die? Long pause. And she very honestly said, no. And it turned out she was living in quiet despair about how do I make myself acceptable to God? And she was deeply afraid of him. And along with feeling anti him, I think that's our other natural 
feeling about God. It's, it's fear. Maybe right now you're fearful. You have done something so bad that you couldn't possibly come back into a relationship with him. Or maybe you're feeling it's too late in life for you. An, an elderly relative in her 80s once said to me, I, I wish I had your faith, but I've left it too late. She had the pension plan view of God, which is that you have to pay in these installments of goodness throughout your life to get the payout of his acceptance at the end. And it's not like that. What's unique about Christianity is that it doesn't say do it yourself, but done. It says God has done that first Easter time everything necessary for you or me to be back in relationship with him. So look on in that reading on page 4 to verse 28, just near the bottom of the page. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it out to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, you can understand a dying man saying, I am finished, but that's not what he says. He says, it is finished. It was the word that they would have used back then uh, to say, job done. You, you finished an essay or a piece of DIY. It was the word they used back then to print across debts or bills that have been paid off, paid in full. And as Jesus died, it's that exact word he chose to explain what was going on. He was saying, in dying, I'm finishing the job I came to do I'm paying for all the forgiveness you need for having said no to my Father and living your own way. Now, I'm often asked, but why did there have to be this, what seems such a crude kind of payment or sacrifice? Why can't God just forgive like us? And the answer is because he's not like us. He's God. He's ultimately responsible for upholding the moral fabric of this universe. So he has to find a way of forgiving us which doesn't just amount to sweeping all our wrongdoing under the carpet and that way was the cross. So imagine with me that history has just ended and we're at the day of judgment. And the Christian message promises that if I turn to Jesus and I accept him as king, not only will he forgive my entire past and accept me, but he will continue to forgive me whenever I need it and accept me right up to the end when he welcomes me in. So fast forward to the day of judgment. He's welcoming me in and someone stands up and says, you can't do that. What about everything that Ian Garrett has done wrong? Surely you've got to do justice on that. And because of the cross, God will be able to say, I have done justice on everything Ian Garrett done wrong, did wrong when my son died in his place. So um, imagine this hand stands for Jesus and this white file stands for the record of his life, the only perfect life ever lived because he was God become human, the only one capable of pulling it off and never deserving of judgment. And then imagine that this black file stands for the record of all your or my wrongdoing, which does deserve the judgment of being kept out of his kingdom. And the Bible is saying that when he died on the cross, Jesus took responsibility for all that, took on himself the judgment for all that, so that on the one hand we can be forgiven, and the other hand justice is done. Nothing is swept under the carpet. So back to our scene um, on the Day of Judgment. There is someone saying, you, you can't let Ian Garrett in. And God says to a nearby angel, uh, go and get his file. And the angel comes back with this white file with my name on it. And God says, didn't you find anything else? And the angel said, well, there was a black file. And God says, what was in it? The angel says, well, only one page. And God says, well, what was on it? And the angel says, paid in full. And when Jesus said, it is finished, job done, paid in full, he was saying his death has done everything necessary to see you forgiven for everything. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, however long you've kept God at arm's length. He could forgive you and have you back in relationship with him 
right now. In fact, I should put it more strongly. He would love to do that because he gave his son out of love for us and his son came willingly out of love for us. And I wonder if you are beginning to believe that, daring to believe that. My final question is this, how do we need to respond? Uh, my wife Tess and I have just had an anniversary, so it was just over nine years ago that I was sitting somewhere down in that forest of chairs, standing somewhere down there, and I was asked, Ian, will you have Tess to be your wife? And I said, I will. And at that point, I'd done everything necessary for Tess to be married to me, but that was not automatically the case. The question still had to be answered, Tess, will you have him? And in giving his son to die for us, God has said his, I will. I will forgive you and have you back, whoever you are, whatever you've done. But that isn't automatic. The question still has to be answered by every one of us. Will you? Will you have Jesus? Will you ask him for the forgiveness you need? And will you accept him as king? Because although Jesus died, he is not dead. That first Easter, he also rose again. He is alive in heaven and he is calling all of us through his words in the Bible to respond to him. So to end with, would you turn over to page six of the service sheet? We'll just look briefly at one snippet of that second Bible reading to see what is on offer. So over the page to page six and that second reading. Jesus' dead body was put in a tomb on Good Friday. Saturday was their rest day, so nothing happened. It was Easter Sunday morning when his followers came to give the body its final burial treatment, so they thought only to find the tomb open and the body gone. Jesus then began appearing to them bodily resurrected from the dead. And on page six, if you look down to verse 16 in the final paragraph near the bottom, the resurrected Jesus appears to a follower called Mary who had last seen him as a corpse. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Presumably she's grabbed him. For I've not yet ascended to the Father. In other words, return permanently to my Father in heaven. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. My God and your God. And to anyone who trusts in Jesus, as Mary was doing. Jesus also says, my Father is now your father. Uh, some friends of ours, some of you know them, have just adopted a baby girl, and they already had a little boy of their own. And I guess if he'd been old enough to think like this on the day she arrived in their home, he, he might have looked into her cot and said, you know, my father is now your father. A year earlier, she had uh, no knowledge of that father, no relationship with him at all. He basically didn't exist as far as she was concerned. Now, thanks to adoption, she's going to grow up calling him daddy. And thanks to his death for us on the cross, Jesus can bring us from no relationship at all with God, not even convinced he exists, to calling him father. From being anti him, from fearing his judgment, to knowing him as the one perfect father that we actually can trust with our lives. That's what Jesus offers. Let me just end like this. Um, imagine I drew a line of where everyone here stands in relationship with God. At one end of the line, there will be those who can say, I, I do know God as my Father. I know I'm forgiven. I'm trying to live in response to him. I know where I'm going where I, when I die. And there's nothing better in life than to be able to say all of that. At the other hand, there will be those who just can't yet say any of that. You're not even sure this is true. So those for whom God is just that distant figure like the Queen. And if that's you, can I say thanks for coming? And do please keep coming and looking into the Christian message because God has made himself known through Jesus. He does want you to know him as personally as others here do. But maybe tonight you're, you're in the middle of my line. Um, you've crossed the bridge of knowing it's true. You've not crossed the bridge of responding to Jesus. So I'm going to end with a prayer which you could use to do that if you want to. Let me just read it out before I lead us in prayer so you can 
think, is it appropriate for you? Here's the prayer. Father God, thank you for your love in sending your son to die for me. Please forgive me and accept me as your child. And please help me live for you as my king from now on. You may be further back than that or further on. I'm not encouraging you to do anything that's not appropriate for you. But if you want to pray that prayer, then uh, you could echo it to God in your mind as I lead us now. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for your love in sending your son to die for me. Please forgive me and accept me as your child. And please help me live for you as my king from now on. Amen.